Hello, and thank you for joining us again today and taking part in our continuing study on developing a hearing spirit. Let's start by reading some key scriptures for this study. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And Romans 8, 14 through 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit of God is a witness to us. And what does a witness do? They tell us things that we didn't know before. The Holy Spirit is our witness of the things that God wants us to know and to act upon. He is our communication channel with God the Father himself. And the Holy Spirit will give us directions from the Lord on a continual basis. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. God's Spirit will guide us in all our ways if we develop our spirit so we can recognize His directions when we receive them. Remember that our spirit and our mind are connected. What touches one also touches the other. Our goal is to strengthen our spirit and bring it to the point that we are clearly sensing the Holy Spirit's directions to us all the time. And the longer I live, the more I've come to realize that this skill is the most important spiritual skill a Christian needs to develop. To live an abundant life and to receive all the blessings and the protection that the Lord provides, we must improve that skill. It is what enables God to be able to elevate our spiritual lives to a supernatural level. And if we can get ourselves trained up to that level, we'll be able to see the greater works that Jesus spoke of in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Folks, these miraculous things should be happening in our lives and in our churches. But miracles haven't been commonplace. And the reason we want to see miracles happening is so that God gets all the glory. That's our main goal. Now, in our last session, we learned some training steps that are revealed in the Bible, which we can use to develop a hearing spirit. And I want to just briefly review them. We found that we can feed God's word into our spirit by meditating on the word. We saw that our lives can be transformed by renewing our minds to the Word because it will develop an expectation that we'll receive God's promises. We learned that by putting God's Word in our mind and meditating on that Word, we are feeding, strengthening our spirit. And we also learned that putting the wrong thoughts into our mind will weaken our spirit. So we must guard our spirit and protect what we are doing in our mind and what we are dwelling on. We need to police the thoughts that we allow to enter our mind. Now, the Bible tells us that our spirits are actually capable of producing what I'm going to call spiritual forces. It calls these forces the fruits of our spirit. Or we could say they're the produce or the product that comes from our spirit. The fruit of your labor on your job is the paycheck that you get to take home. It's the same way with the fruits of the Spirit. Our spirit can produce tangible benefits in our lives here on the earth. So let's talk about what these fruits are and how they work. Now we know that our spirits produce faith, which Jesus himself said is capable of moving mountains. 
So that's a pretty nice force to have available. And the faith that our spirits produce also enables us to receive blessings from the Lord in our lives. Another big benefit. But our spirits can produce other spiritual forces as well. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When properly applied, each of these spiritual forces can also have an impact on both us and the world around us. The forces of love, patience, and gentleness massively improve our family life and our relationship with others. The force of peace greatly enhances our mental state, our reasoning processes, and promotes logical thinking. The force of temperance and self-control gives us wisdom that helps us to stay youthful and healthy in our diet, in our exercise. The forces of goodness and gentleness will make us good witnesses for the Lord and aids to those who we can minister to. Our Creator designed us to have all these forces working together in us, and He designed us this way for a reason. Our spirit is designed to be the leader and the director over our lives. Our spirit is designed to be in control of us and to contain the spiritual forces that will dominate our enemy, Satan. When he tries to interfere with our lives, these forces can still him. He can't force his way into our lives because Jesus destroyed his works. So unless we let him in, he's helpless. He is helpless against us because we have the power of God operating in and through our spirit and because we've been given spiritual authority in and through Jesus. We've been given the authority to use Jesus' name, which embodies all of the power and the authority that Jesus himself used while he was on the earth. In Mark 16, starting at verse 17, the word says, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Aren't these exactly the same things that Jesus did when he was on the earth? And he said these signs will be seen in the lives of believers. In Philippians 2, starting at verse 9, it says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, the power in the name of Jesus reaches everywhere, even where the enemy is, and he must bow to that name. And we have been given the authority to use that name and the power in that name. And remember, Jesus himself said, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That means our goal is to bring all of the glory to the Father, all the time. We don't want to try to use God's power just as we think it should be used. We must listen and hear from the Holy Spirit and then act exactly as He directs us to. That's how Jesus operated when He was here on the earth. Jesus Himself said in John 14, verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Everything Jesus did was directed by and done by his heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit who was giving Jesus the Father's directions. He operated under the continual direction of the Holy Spirit 
And if we want to see miraculous things like he did, maybe we need to act like he did too. So here's a really important point. In order to do these things properly, we have to be following the directions of the Holy Spirit. We have to act where, when, and how he tells us to. We don't decide for ourselves what we want to do. Instead, we get his directions before we act. It's our responsibility to make sure that we are always alert to the Holy Spirit's directions and then follow them. This is crucially important because there are forces that will try to influence us to do what we want to do. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in Romans 8 verse 5. In the Amplified Version, it says, For those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those who are living according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now, when Paul refers to our flesh, he's talking about the drives that we have to satisfy our own desires. These are things that make us comfortable and satisfy our needs. Sometimes these things oppose the things that we know the Lord wants us to do, and they are counter to the ways he wants us to live our lives. For example, your flesh will try to get you to sleep in on Sunday morning instead of going to church. Your flesh will tell you to retaliate against the person who rubs you the wrong way at work. It will tell you to not be truthful about the mistake you made in your job. When natural desires conflict with our spiritual directions, we need to make the right choice and do what we know is right in our spirit. Now, I'm sure you're aware of this battle between your spirit and your flesh. You notice it every time you see something that your flesh nature likes, but that you also know is bad for you. That might be ice cream or candy or cigarettes or drugs or bad magazines, or sin-filled movies. In that moment, when your flesh is saying, I want to do this, a battle occurs in your mind. On the one side is your spirit, and it's telling you to keep away. And on the other side is your flesh nature, and it's telling you to go for it. This is the moment when our spirit is designed to rise up and take control of the situation. It will say to you, back away from the temptation. And right then, there's a moment of decision when your mind decides what you are going to do. This is when the time that you've spent training your mind with God's word will make a big difference. If you've been meditating on the word sufficiently, you'll know it. Because in those moments, another feeling will rise up in you and that feeling doesn't want you to do the wrong thing. It will pull you towards making the right choice. And in these moments, your flesh nature will try to overcome your spirit. And if you decide in your mind to side with your flesh, you'll weaken your spirit. And every time your mind repeats that process, it will further weaken your spirit until your spirit will get into the habit of giving in to your flesh. And that's when you're in big trouble because the enemy has trapped you into a habit of acting wrongly. But here's the good news. You can get out of this trap. It's going to require the Holy Spirit's help and you'll need to apply a little discipline. But you really can break out of the enemy's snare. You can regain control if you intentionally start to decide to let your conscience, which is, by the way, the voice of your spirit, let your conscience guide you. If you are fighting a battle like this right now, get your Bible out and stay in the word. Feed it into your spirit by meditating on God's word and staying far away from worldly media. By now, You've probably come to realize that we have some work to do in order to develop a sensitive spirit, but it is so worth the effort. It will change your life, and it'll change your life for the better, like nothing else can. Years ago, I asked the Lord why he chose this form of communication that takes such an effort on our part. 
I asked him if it wouldn't be more natural if he would just speak to us audibly so we could hear him with our own ears. And he answered me and he told me the reason. He said that using a natural method of communication through our ears would be much more vulnerable to the devil's interference. Don't you think that the enemy could arrange for things to be said or spoken within earshot of us or have us hear sounds? Listen, even we humans can do that to one another. Advertisers do this to us all the time through the media. And the enemy would also use worldly people and their actions to impact us. In addition to that, our natural senses are also affected by our own likes and dislikes. They can be affected by our feelings in any given moment. And the Lord pointed out to me that spiritual communication is far superior to any other type of communication. It's faster because the Lord can give you extensive amounts of insight in an instant. Spiritual communication can't be counterfeited by our enemy because it's transmitted through our reborn spirit to which the enemy has no access. Ephesians 1.13 says, In Jesus you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The presence of the Holy Spirit in you was God's seal that you belong to him. As far as the enemy goes, it's hands off. The Holy Spirit is present in you for the express purpose to direct you and to keep you safe and to bring you into the blessings that God has for you. So it's crucially important that we protect our minds and our spirits. And it's our job to keep our spiritual senses exercised and strong. It's our task to protect our precious spiritual sensitivity. We don't want to be without God's precious gift of being able to be directed by Him all the time. We don't want to get lazy and let worldly thinking damage our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's leading. For we really can be continually led by the Lord if we do our part and stay close to Him. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today in our study. Please don't forget to spend time this week meditating on the scriptures that we covered. Jesus said that his words are spirit and that they're powerful and that they are life and they can and will change your life. I hope you will join us again next time as we continue to learn how to develop a hearing spirit. And God bless you.